Okay, so our, our next speaker is Bob Anderson from Lamont Doherty Earth Observatory. And um, based on what I can see on the projector, he's going to talk to us about nothing. There we go. Um, he's going to talk to us about ocean carbon storage during the last glacial maximum. We wanted to make sure that we included a paleo perspective in our ocean carbon session. So um, thanks, Bob. Take it away. Okay. Thank you, Nikki, and thank you all for, for being here. I'm really happy to be able to speak today about carbon storage in the ocean during the last ice age. I suspect this is a topic that most of you don't think about every day, but there's a lot we can learn about the sensitivity of the ocean carbon cycle to climate change by looking at the carbon in the ocean under past climate conditions. Since most of you don't think about paleo processes very often, a lot of the talk will be introductory material. I'll also include a fair bit of review of recent literature, and I'll show a little bit of results, uh, the unpublished results of, of my own, and these are the, the collaborators on the unpublished work that I'll be showing. I like to start with this slide. You've probably all seen something similar to this before, but it shows the very tight coupling between carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, in the top red curve, and climate on the bottom over Earth's recent geological history. So this is based on spliced ice core records from Antarctica covering the last 800,000 years from 800,000 years ago to present. The last glacial maximum is here around 20,000 years ago. Cold, warming during deglaciation, low CO2, rising CO2, a very tight coupling throughout Earth's history between CO2 in the atmosphere and climate. And so this raises two very important fundamental questions. The first is, what's controlling atmospheric CO2? And the second is, how much impact does this have on climate? It's the first question that I'll be addressing today, what's controlling CO2? We've known the short answer to that for 35 years. And the answer is the ocean. The ocean has to be the reservoir controlling atmospheric CO2. The atmosphere lost 200 gigatons of carbon during the last ice age. The terrestrial biosphere lost much more, maybe 600 gigatons of carbon. The only reservoir that's large enough and nimble enough to take up that much carbon that quickly is the deep ocean. So the deep ocean processes had to have been responsible for the variability that I showed you on the last slide. We can think about carbon storage in the deep ocean by look, starting with the modern ocean as our reference point. And to do this, I'll look at a section down the Pacific Ocean uh, from Alaska to Antarctica, as shown here. And one way of representing carbon storage, especially storage of respiratory carbon, is to just make a section of apparent oxygen utilization, because we know that for every mole of oxygen that's consumed by respiration, there's roughly a mole of CO2 produced as well. So we see that in the modern ocean, the, the, the hot spot for carbon storage is in the deep North Pacific. I think we all learn this in, in chemical oceanography. Uh, the nutrient distributions look similar. So this is where we have the highest storage of respiratory carbon today. The dominant hypothesis about how the ocean changed during the last ice age is illustrated in this cartoon from a review paper in Nature by Danny Sigmund in 2010. But it's based on conceptual models put forward by Ed Boyle back in the 1980s. So on top, we have the modern ocean. On the bottom, we have the illustration of what we think the last ice age ocean looked like. The darkness of the blue shows the intensity of carbon storage, respiratory carbon. Uh, the way these illustrations work, Greenland's on the left, Antarctica's in the middle, so this is the Atlantic and the Pacific, so it goes from north to south and then south to north. We have today's overturning circulation illustrated by the arrows and the density of the blue, or the deepness of the blue showing carbon storage. So just as I showed you in the actual data from the modern ocean, we have the greatest carbon storage today and in intermediate and upper deep water in the North Pacific. The reigning hypothesis is that during the last ice age, due to changes in overturning circulation, much more rapid ventilation of the upper ocean, much slower overturning of the deep ocean, some effect of ice cover, shift of the winds, increased dust input to the southern ocean, all of these factors contributed to changing the ocean from something like this to something like this during the last ice age. So a lot of carbon storage, low oxygen, high carbon storage in the deep ocean. This is the conceptual model. So how did we get there? And this gets back to some of the processes that Scott talked about in the previous talk. 
Um, this is a, a slide that I, I like to use in a, a lot of different talks because it illustrates an important point about the biological pump and how the biological pump controls atmospheric CO2. So here's Antarctica over on the left, a section through the ocean. The biological pump converts CO2 to organic matter that sinks, and the deep sea respiration converts the organic matter back to CO2, and it's physical mixing along isopycnals, deep isopycnals that outcrop around Antarctica that brings the CO2 back and vents it to the atmosphere. So biological pump 101, it's the interplay between the biological drawdown and the physical return that controls atmospheric CO2. Stimulating the uptake of CO2 would lower atmospheric uh, CO2. Retarding the physics that brings CO2 back up to the surface would do the same thing. We know that some combination of stimulated biological pump and impeded physical return occurred during the last ice age. And that's why the ocean held more CO2. The, the, the short answer is we think it's both, but we can't be completely quantitative about how important each factor was. Okay, now in, when thinking about the biological pump, we need to keep in mind the terminology. I'll be talking a lot about the efficiency of the biological pump, but really there are two ways the biological pump could have drawn down atmospheric CO2 during the ice age. There could have been an increased capacity, and there have been a number of papers that talk about greater ocean nutrient inventory during the ice ages. I think most people have, have discarded this hypothesis, but it's still out there. The main hypothesis is that the ocean's biological pump was more efficient. And efficiency was defined by these classic papers back in the 1980s as the fraction of upwell nutrients that are consumed biologically and exported to depth as organic matter. Okay, this is the efficiency of the biological pump as defined in the original papers. It's illustrated in an earlier review paper by Danny Sigmund, in this case Sigmund and Boyle in Nature, um, by this cartoon. If you imagine this as the ocean's overturning circulation, upwelling primarily around Antarctica, but everywhere in the ocean brings DIC and nutrients to the surface. The nutrients can have two fates. Initially, the water outgasses CO2 to the atmosphere. If the nutrients are taken up and converted to organic matter, the CO2 is reabsorbed and, and sinks to depth as organic matter. But if the nutrients return to depth as preformed nutrients, the CO2 is left back in the atmosphere. So the simplest mathematical representation of the efficiency of the biological pump is just one minus the ratio of the global inventory of preformed nutrients to the global inventory of nutrients in the ocean. And since most of the ocean is the deep ocean, you can substitute deep ocean in here. So you can find this in uh, Sigmund and Boyle papers. You can find this in Sarmiento and Gruber, the textbook, a lot of other textbooks. But this is how to best and most simply represent the efficiency of the biological pump. So to draw down atmospheric CO2, we have to transfer more of the nutrients through this pathway and less of the nutrients through this pathway. And in terms of current thinking, the idea is that both stimulation of biology and reduction of physics played a role. That is, there was both a change in ocean circulation and a change in the efficiency of the biological pump. I'm not going to have time to go through all of the evidence for each of these. If there's time at the end, I'll show you a little bit about ocean circulation. But in terms of stimulation of the biological pump, the main effect was in the, in the subantarctic. The region between roughly 40 and 50 degrees south was just extremely productive during the last ice age. Further south in the Southern Ocean, there was not much productivity. But the important thing is that everywhere we look, uh, sorry, two of the three main high nutrient low chlorophyll regions, the North Pacific and the Southern Ocean, study of nitrogen isotopes has made it very clear that nutrients were more efficiently used during the last ice age than today. Now, efficiency, as I said, can be draw driven by physics as well as by dust, but I think both played a role. Now, this leads to the question of where and how was CO2 stored? We've known this principle for a long time. It was, this is a quote from Danny Sigmund's review paper, but it's really summarizing a point made by Wally Broker back in one of his seminal papers in 1982, explaining how the ocean could control atmospheric CO2. Any biological pump mechanism for lowering ice age PCO2 decreases the dissolved oxygen content of the ocean interior. 
We've known this since the 1980s. I was one of several people who worked on this in the 1980s, tried to find geochemical proxies for oxygen in the deep ocean. Um, you haven't seen any papers on that because it, it, nothing worked out. <laughs> okay, but we, we oh, this is interesting. It, it, it changed the, the spacing. Anyway, we have some indirect methods that have been proposed and, and used uh, more recently. And it's based on the fact that we can measure sediment redox state in the past. Because when the sediments are reducing, chemically reducing, redox sensitive trace metals like uranium and rhenium are preserved and buried in the sediment. The sediment redox state depends on the level of bottom water oxygen overlying the sediments, as well as the rain of organic carbon to the sediments. Because it's the organic carbon that fuels the respiration that drives the sediments into anaerobic respiration, where redox sensitive trace metals like uranium and rhenium can be precipitated. Now we can infer organic carbon rain to the sea floor using geochemical proxies like excess barium or opal. And the strategy that many people have used over the last few years is to show, is to compare the Ice Age ocean to the modern ocean using these indirect proxies to infer changes in bottom water oxygen. This idea was first proposed, as far as I know, in 1997 by Roger Francois when he was here at Woods Hole, but it wasn't really picked up for more than a decade. And the first paper uh, to, to, that led a large number of papers in recent years was by Sam Jacquard, looking at a site in the subarctic North Pacific. So here time is running from left to right. Unfortunately, there's no convention for time, direction, and, and paleoceanography. But I'll try to point out which direction time runs we have the last ice age shaded in gray. Here's our sediment redox indicator, orthogenic uranium. So very reducing sediments during the last ice age, becoming less reducing toward the present. Our, our organic carbon rain proxies, opal and excess barium, both show lower levels during the last ice age, hot peak during the deglaciation, and then uh, intermediate during the Holocene. But the main point of this paper is that the only way to have more reducing sediments during the last ice age with lower rain of organic carbon to the seabed is that the deep North Pacific must have had substantially lower oxygen during the last ice age than today. As I said, this was the first paper. A number of other papers have come out. This was in 2009. This was the first paper. Um, our group followed in 2010 with a paper on the Equatorial Pacific reaching the same conclusion. Uh, Sam and Eric Galbraith had another paper in 2012 so the first work in the Pacific, then moving into the Atlantic, I've got Hugacker, uh, work in the North Atlantic off of the Iberia, show low oxygen during the last ice age. Julia Gottschalk from uh, Cambridge, the Southern Ocean, I'm sorry, the South Atlantic. Uh, since 2010 or so, Sam Jacquard and I have partnered on a series of papers, most recently, earlier this year, showing that the deep Southern Ocean uh, had much lower oxygen during the last ice age. But in fact, throughout the last 100,000 years, deep water oxygenation in the Southern Ocean co-varied with atmospheric CO2, indicating a strong role for ventilation on both deep oxygen and atmospheric CO2. Sam wrote the first review paper on this in 2014, summarizing available data to that point. And look at the Pacific, where we have the most data density. I wouldn't look at the scale bar because we really hadn't calibrated these proxies, but where it's orange, it indicates lower oxygen in deep water during the last ice age. Where it's blue, it indicates higher oxygen in intermediate water. And this is a very robust conclusion that's uh, consistent across a number of proxies, many different investigators. Intermediate waters were better ventilated during the last ice age. Deep waters were more poorly ventilated or had lower oxygen during the last ice age, consistent with Ed Boyle's nutrient deepening hypothesis. Most of the work has been done just on the last ice age, but there are starting to come out a few papers looking further back in time. This is a paper that just came out last month in paleoceanography, looking at the deep North Pacific, now very deep water depths here. Um, I won't take time to explain the proxies. This is going back a million years, now a million years ago to present. The red arrows show the last five ice ages. And the interesting thing that they pointed out in this paper is that the sediments in the deep North Pacific were so reducing during the last five ice ages that all of the iron oxide magnetic minerals just completely dissolved away. 
and the magnetic properties of these sediments are gone. And it takes pretty reducing conditions to dissolve all those iron oxides. And we know from other studies that the ice ages, during the ice ages, the organic carbon range of the sediments in the North Pacific was lower than at present. So to get very reducing conditions to dissolve these magnetic minerals with low organic carbon rain requires very low oxygen, and that's the point of this paper. Okay, to, to summarize up to this point, we have strong qualitative evidence for low oxygen in the deep ocean during the last ice age. We have increased efficiency of the biological pump. We know that from the nitrogen isotopes in the Southern Ocean and the Subarctic North Pacific. We would like to know how low was oxygen, how much CO2 was stored, and what were the physical and biogeochemical processes involved. I will try to answer the first of those questions by looking at a couple of cores in the central equatorial Pacific collected by the Jagoffs program in the early 1990s. Uh, we had a paper that just came out earlier this year looking at the, the paleoproductivity record. Again, the last 500,000 years down is Ice Age. But the main thing here is that we're looking at two inorganic tracers of organic carbon rain to the sediments. We look at these inorganic tracers because generally their preservation is, is more stable and higher than for organic carbon. But the important point here is that the two tracers give us consistent records. That is, the barium and the opal followed similar patterns over the last 500,000 years. So we can be confident that when we, we can use these inorganic tracers to reconstruct past changes in, in organic carbon rain to the seabed in this region. But then when we look at organic biomarkers and their preservation in these cores, we see a very different pattern. So just to orient you, um, on top we have the excess barium and opal. The darker, core, the darker record is from the equator, the lighter record is from two degrees south. We see that in both the inorganic proxies during the last ice age, the shaded region here, there are either lower fluxes or no change between the ice age and the Holocene. But when we look at the organic biomarkers, in this case, the alkanones produced by coccolithophorids and brassicasterol produced by primarily diatoms, but also by other taxa, we see an order of magnitude higher fluxes during the last ice age than during the Holocene in these very same cores using the very same methods. So this inconsistency between the organic biomarkers and the inorganic tracers are telling us that the organic biomarkers experience much greater preservation during the ice age then subsequently, preservation we now know uh, from, from work of Rick Kyle and Greg Cowie and many others that is largely due to changes in bottom water oxygen. There have been a number of papers that have exploited the Arabian Sea as a natural laboratory, examining the preservation of organic carbon down slope across the oxygen minimum zone, looking at preservation as a function of oxygen content. And this key paper by Kiel and Cowie shows that below an oxygen level of about 35 micromoles per kilogram, you see a dramatic increase in organic carbon preservation. Greg Cowie has a more recent paper from the Arabian Sea suggesting that this threshold might be a little bit lower, but I'm just going to take this value to say that in our cores, when we see this dramatic increase in biomarker preservation during the last ice age, that's telling us that probably the bottom water oxygen was less than a around 35 micromoles per kilogram. Today, Jagoff's measured 168 micromoles per kilogram, so that tells us that oxygen was lowered by about 130 micromoles per kilogram in the deep Pacific during the last ice age. I want to get to the rates, so I'm going to skip over how we get the, the structure of the water column. Uh, I'll answer questions later. But we look at a series of pores in the eastern Atlantic look at the preservation of organic matter, and we can reconstruct what I think is the oxygen distribution in the deep Pacific during the last ice age. So intermediate depths had higher oxygen, but below about a kilometer depth all the way to the bottom, the oxygen concentration was much lower, we think, during the last ice age compared to today. And I'll go through the details of this later if anyone wants. But I want to get through the process of reconstructing the complete inorganic carbon system in the deep ocean during the last ice age based on these results. So using Jagoff's data on the equator, we know salinity, temperature, oxygen solubility, measured oxygen, 
so we can calculate apparent oxygen utilization as the difference. For the last ice age, we know that the global ocean was 3% saltier due to fresh water being tied up on land as ice. We know the deep Pacific was about two degrees colder. And so we can calculate oxygen solubility. We use our organic biomarker preservation threshold to say oxygen was roughly 35 micromoles per kilogram. The difference gives us the AOU of the deep Pacific during the last ice age, much larger than today about 150 micromoles per kilogram greater. We divide this by the respiratory coefficient. We say that respiratory CO2 was about 100 micromoles per kilogram greater in the ice age, last glacial maximum, than today. That gives us one parameter for the inorganic carbon system. We can get another from a lot of work that's been done by Cat Allen and Ji Min Yu, two of my co-authors, reconstructing the carbonate ion distribution in the deep ocean during the last ice age. There's a lot of information here. I just want to focus on the deep Pacific, these bottom two points, that the last ice age in the Holocene, these two points, had no significant difference in their carbonate ion <coughs> concentration between the last ice age and today. Now, we've just seen that the much greater AOU tells us that the, there had to have been titration of carbonate ion by addition of respiratory CO2. So there must have been calcite compensation. As calcium carbonate dissolved, and response to that buildup of respiratory CO2 to lower the carbonate, to raise the carbonate ion concentration back to its modern value. We can do a series of calculations to, do, to do, derive exactly what the changes in DIC and alkalinity must have been. This is just a summary of the calculations that I did, starting from modern conditions, removing fresh water for ice, adding respiratory CO2 lowering alkalinity but because of the organic nitrogen is regenerated as nitric acid, and then dissolving enough calcium carbonate to raise the carbonate ion concentration back to its original value. And we get a change in DIC of about 217 micromoles per kilogram, equally derived from respiratory CO2 and calcium carbonate dissolution. These are the details of the constants that we used in the calculations, if anyone is interested. We can show those results graphically, and maybe this is a little more intuitive for most people in TCO2 alkalinity space. Starting with modern deep water, there's a small change due to extraction of fresh water and buildup of ice on land. We add the respiratory carbon due to increased uh, carbon storage. And then we have to get back to this red dashed line, which is the modern carbonate ion concentration, on along a slope of one to two. That is one TCO2 for every alkalinity, two alkalinities, to get back to this line. And this is how we get to the DIC and total CO2 of deep Pacific water during the last ice age. We can do a, a real back of the envelope calculation to estimate how much carbon storage that would have been for the global ocean. Just saying the deep ocean is half the ocean. Suppose the entire deep ocean held 108 micromoles per kilogram more CO2 we come up with about 840 gigatons of carbon, additional carbon stored in the deep ocean during the last ice age. And this very nicely balances what the, we, we know that the atmosphere lost 200 gigatons of carbon. There's a lot of uncertainty in the terrestrial biosphere, but the latest estimate by Peterson et al. is around 600 gigatons of carbon. So the balance is pretty good. There are other methods of estimating carbon storage in the deep ocean completely independent from the method that I used. The first was by Michael Sarnthine a few, years, a few years ago. He takes the modern relationship between radiocarbon age and DIC in the deep ocean, combines that with estimated radiocarbon age of the deep ocean during the last glacial maximum by analyzing benthic foraminifera and the radiocarbon content. And he estimates that the increase in DIC storage of the deep ocean was between 700 and 1,000 gigatons of carbon during the last ice age. Just last month, Andreas Schmittner had a paper come out, again, a very different approach, global model sensitivity study, getting a best fit to the global distribution of C13 and N15 during the last glacial maximum. And it comes up with 600 to 800 gigatons of carbon stored in the deep ocean. So all of these estimates are pretty consistent, given that they have, all have fairly large uncertainties. So at least we have a first pass at how low oxygen was in the deep ocean, how much CO2 was stored. 
And now the last thing I want to get to, and this is why I skipped the other slides, is what was the physical and biogeochemical factor, or what were the factors involved? The primary factor, we think, is a change in the rate of ocean circulation. This is another paper, just came out in the last month or so, um, again from Cambridge in the UK. It, it plots versus water depth, the difference in radiocarbon age between bottom water and the atmosphere. These triangles are the modern ocean, and then these colored regions are various sectors of the Atlantic Ocean during the last ice age. So even in the Northwest Atlantic, very well ventilated, much older deep waters compared to the atmosphere. So we go to the Northeast Atlantic and finally to the South Atlantic, much, much older water. Okay, this is maybe not unexpected. It's been suggested before. The thing that, about this paper that I find really intriguing is that they compare the deep water versus atmosphere radiocarbon age versus C13 at the dissolved inorganic carbon. Both of these are obtained by analyzing benthic foraminifera. The, the important point here is that the gray dashed line is the modern relationship for the global ocean, and then the solid black line is the last glacial maximum relationship just for the Atlantic. And the slope of this line gives you the rate of organic, uh, sorry, the rate, rate of respiratory CO2 addition to the deep water. And the slopes are not significantly different. So what this is telling us is that the, the strength of the biological pump overall globally was not that different during the last ice age. The real difference was the rate of overturning, much, much slower in the deep ocean during the last ice age than today. I'll skip that, go on to the final slide. So why did the deep ocean hold more CO2 during the last ice age? The short answer is all of the above. Okay. The ocean was cooler. Solubility of CO2 was greater. Metabolic rates were slower. These are both minor but non-negligible factors. The two main factors were greater ocean stratification, reduced overturning, and then I didn't talk about dust fertilization of the sub-Antarctic. These were the two main factors. They both contributed to lower deep ocean oxygen, and then calcium carbonate compensation also played a significant role. All of these, there's a line missing from the bottom, all of these acted synergistically to lower atmospheric CO2. They're all significant. They all played more than 10% of the total role in lowering atmospheric CO2. Okay, thank you. We have time for as many as two questions. Just back here. Thank you. Um, so there are recently some papers proposing, you know, the role of the volcano in the glacial interglacial CO2 cycle. Do you have any comment on that? You're talking about subsea volcanoes? Um, both subsea and also the uh, volcano on land. Um, okay, the volcanoes on land, they, there was an increase in eruption during the deglaciation, but they occurred as near as can be tell from, told from reconstructing uh, the ashes and the age of those ashes, they were too late. They, they, they occurred after most of the atmospheric CO2 rose. In the deep ocean, I know this is controversial, but because a lot of people are investing a lot of money and looking at the mid-ocean ridges and how they might have released, uh, there might have been increased volcanism and CO2 release during deglaciation. But the fact is, everywhere in the ocean we see that the deep ocean was most alkaline during the deglaciation, best calcium carbonate preservation. That's exactly the opposite of what you would expect if the deep ocean volcanism was responsible for the rise in CO2. I think we can unequivocally rule out that hypothesis and move on to something else. Okay, one last question while we're switching speakers. I'm just curious, based on what you showed, then mode waters would, would have no nutrients um, how, does that match what people know about the equatorial upwelling? Was it less productive during the last ice age? Is Rick Murray still here? Rick and I have been arguing about this for 20 years. Why don't you ask us over beer later? <laughs> Ser seriously, Rick says yes, I say no. 